Well, hello and well, welcome hello and welcome to today's um, webinar on COVID-19 and employment law issues. Um, this is WebEx number eight in our session. So for those of you that have joined us all the way through, well done. <laughs> eight down, I'm not sure how many more we have to go. The purpose of this scheme, as I say, is to chat you through the what did come out on Friday night. I think actually the detail is is fairly limited. There's not a great of new information contained in what's been published um, since the last time we spoke. But Jen uh, is going to talk you through what what developments we do have and the issues for you to to be aware of. Um, and then, as always, if we've got questions, we can try and pick up as many of those as we can as we go through. So, Jen, if I can hand over to you um, to pick up on the what we've had published since Friday night. Absolutely. Um, we'll just launch into um, to the changes uh, that we've had details of. I think just helpful to split it into two categories to begin with. Um, so we'll come on to talk about FFS, which I think is absolutely the best acronym ever, but just for the whole scheme. Um, we'll come on to talk about that in a little while. What I want to focus on um, is just to revisit and refresh um, some of the other restrictions that are coming in with effect from the 1st of July. Um, I guess what you would call in relation to the more kind of standard furlough or what you've been doing previously. So. It closes, the scheme closes to new entrants um, at the end of June, except for returning parents. And we'll come on to talk about that exception um, to the to the deadline for new entrants. But what that in effect means is that you cannot furlough anyone from the 1st of July who hasn't previously been furloughed. And um, that means that they have to have been furloughed for a period of three weeks um, as a minimum before the 1st of July, which is where this deadline of the 10th of June um, came from effectively. So you'll have seen a number of people um, sort of making decisions in the lead up to the 10th of June about whether they wanted to put people on furlough at that point, um, almost in order to have the ability to furlough them um, later on within the scheme. Um, so that's the first thing um, to, to note. The other thing which I know Morag mentioned um, a couple of weeks ago was just be careful because there's also a cap on the number of people that you furlough from the 1st of July. So you cannot put in claims for more employees in July, August, September or October um, than whatever your greatest number of employees was in any of the claim periods before that. So um, say, for example, the most employees that you'd furloughed um, prior to the end of June in any given month was 50 employees. You can't then make a claim for 60 or 70 or even 51 employees um, from July onwards. So that uh, you can see that's just a tapering um, provision to effectively um, ensure that the government is bringing down the number of individuals that are being furloughed. Um, Jen, just on that point, sorry, just before you go on, one of yeah. the comments that we've seen a fair bit on that is um, it then prevents you from, if employers are looking to use the new flexible furlough and have people on part time, what you might be keen to do is say that I will we'll put everyone on furlough and we'll, we'll have you all doing 50% of your hours, for example. But obviously under that rule, then you're not going to be able to do that because unless at any point prior to the 1st of July, you've had 100% of your staff on mm -hmm. furlough. Um, so it's quite an interesting restriction, I think, from a practical point of view, isn't it? I think so. And I doubt they'll change it, but you you kind of see the incompatibility there, don't you? With the, you're, you're trying to spread the pain, so to speak, in terms of working and not working among your workforce. But what you might end up doing is is um, going over that, that threshold. So... I, I doubt they'll change it, as I say, because I think it is about managing the numbers. And um, a number of you, I'm sure, will have heard in the news today the um, the report, the headline reports um, that unemployment figures are relatively steady. And I think that's been sort of received with an element of a surprise, but coupled with that as an understanding that that's because we've got nine million people um, furloughed which is an incredible figure. And I think, you know, we'll come on to talk about um, 
you know, I guess some of the government's expectations around the take up of the scheme and how they might manage um, audits retrospectively and the use of the scheme. But I think um, it's it's really for them now from July onwards quite a, a, you know important objective that they see a reduction in those statistics of the number of people that are on the scheme. So the other little chink just to be aware of on a practical level is that you can't put in claims for overlapping months. Um, so that doesn't mean that you can't have someone on furlough for overlapping months. So, for example, you could absolutely have someone on furlough that starts on the 15th of July and stays on furlough until uh, the end of August. But what that means is you can't put a claim in in July for that full period. You'll remember they let you put in um, up to two weeks in advance for some of the claim periods or they let you straddle some of the um, the claim periods, but you won't be able to do that. So now what you'll need to do if you're doing one monthly claim is put your claim in for the exact number of days for whatever individuals within that month and then put in, you know, say you've got another chunk of days for that person in August, then you put in the claim then. Um, I don't think that should be too difficult for employers. Actually, I think you might find that's helpful in terms of getting in your mindset of who have we had off in July and what are all the um, figures that we're putting in. I guess the only difficulty might be if, depending on the date you put your claim in, you, you maybe hadn't anticipated putting someone on. Um, but, you know, these are these are all things that will need to go in your kind of decision making matrix of, of who you are furloughing going forward. Um, so from the 1st of July, you can have people on furlough for seven days, um, no less than seven days. So the minimum period is moving from three weeks to seven days, which is which is good news. I think gives employers a bit more flexibility, um, and you know that that applies from the first of July, assuming that that person has previously been furloughed for three weeks before the first of July. So it's not a a case of anyone you're furloughing from uh, the 1st of July, the one week minimum is the only thing you need to worry about. You just, I guess you wouldn't be furloughing them had they not been off for the three weeks previously. But I think that is a that is a helpful change um, and that means that you have a bit more um, agility, I guess, uh, and in terms of perhaps businesses seeing an upturn in activity and work levels. You know, if you furloughed somebody and said, for example, we think this might be uh, for two or three weeks, then you can bring them back earlier um, as long as it's uh, no less than seven days if you do find the, the workloads there. So I think that will be useful. Um, this exception for returning parents, that's just something that we wanted um, to flag. So uh, as I said, you would have to have made sure for anybody else that they'd had a three week period of furlough before the 1st of July. But um, it was actually just the day before, um, I think it was the 9th of June, uh, we got an announcement from the government that they were carving out from that requirement um, anybody who returns from fa statutory family leave. Um, after the 10th of June, they can still be furloughed. So for a number of those individuals, you may not have had them on furlough previously. Um, in fact, you know, for the majority of them, you probably won't have had them on furlough because they've been off on statutory leave. And so you can see the argument there would be that's totally um, you know, indirect discrimination for those individuals um, who are effect, effectively, you know, some of them have maybe been on maternity leave and can't work from home um, when they return from that leave, but then by virtue of that guillotine of the 10th of July, um, wouldn't be able to be furloughed. Um, so I think that was welcome, welcome news and that means those people are in a special category. Um, what we have seen though is a, a, a similar call for people who are in shielding, um, who occurred in the shielding category. So <coughs> I think that's probably lower likelihood of there being large swathes of people who weren't previously um, in the shielding category and then become 
in that category after the 10th of June. But you, you can see how someone's condition could um, have progressed um, and become worse. And so they get one of the letters from the NHS saying that they should continue to shield. And again, that would be very unfair, I think, um, that we're saying to them, well, we hadn't furloughed you before and we can't furlough you now because the um, rule, uh, the rules around that. So um, I think it was raised at um, PMQs last week and I think there was a suggestion that it, the concern had been noted and um, they were looking into it basically. But um, it, it's perhaps a little bit disappointing that that wasn't included in Friday's update. I think we'd hoped that they would maybe catch that at that point. Um, so that's um, that's the exemption and, and the carve out. Um, Jen, just before you go on, I was going to say, do you want to just pick up? There's a couple of questions there about the seven days. Is it seven working days or is it one week? I think it's I think it's one calendar week. Yes. I'm sure. Um, have you I seen that? Right. Yeah, I think yeah. it is one calendar week. Yep. Yeah. Just testing yeah. you to make sure you knew that, Jane. Uh, <laughs> I can't see the other question. What's the other question? And then the other question there was. Um, uh, yeah, if we, so we play our, we pay our employees on the 19th of each month for the whole month. So can we then put our claim for July payroll in, in August? So my understanding is you can't now. You've got to put in your claim in the month that it relates to. So even though you pay the employees on the 19th of the month, you would have to put in your claim for the whole month of July in July. Is that correct? I think that's what the, yeah. the new regulations are saying or the new guidance is saying. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. So they basically say you need to put in your claim for each period of furlough within the relevant month that that falls. Um, so you might want to think about the date on which you put your your claim in um, yeah. so that yeah. you can capture as accurate information as possible. And there's another question there just about this qualification time period. So could someone already been furloughed previously be furloughed for say one and a half weeks at the end of June and that one and a half weeks in July straddling the old and new scheme? So if, as long as they had been, as long as somebody has been furloughed for a minimum of three weeks before the 1st of July, then they can still access the new scheme. If they'd only been furloughed for one and a half weeks before the end of June, then they wouldn't be able to have access to the new scheme. So although adding the one and a half weeks after July would take them up to the three weeks, that wouldn't qualify them. That's correct, I think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. I think it's just difficult. This 10th June date almost makes it even more complicated than it than it needs to be. But I think the reason that is in there is to remind people of the need for there to have been three complete weeks of furlough before the end of um before the end of July. The other question we've been asked is what if you um had people on rotation in phase one? Um and the answer there is again as long as they have have had at least a three week chunk, even if it's been on rotation. And so then say, for example, they went off for three weeks in April, came back for a month, went off for another three weeks um, in June, but were off for a, another week at the end of June, that's still okay because you're, you're ticking the box of they have effectively completed their minimum three weeks um, on at least one occasion before the end of July. Um, yeah. So that should be fine as well. I'm just going to ask you one more question before yeah. I allow you to move on. <laughs> the question of holidays. Um, yeah. I, so we've, we've gone back and forward on this question a few times about whether you can ask someone to take holidays rather than furlough. I'm aware that there has been a bit of coverage recently, probably over the last week or so, where this question has kind of risen its head again. Um, mm -hmm. So the question we're being asked is, can you continue to ask employees to take holidays under the new scheme? Um, do you want to pick that one up? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the situation on holidays, um, as you know, has always been a bit confusing to all of us. The government guidance made it clear a number of weeks ago that it's not incompatible with the scheme for people to be on holiday and on furlough at the same time, but that you have to pick up the tab for the extra, so they basically have to be paid their, their full pay. Um, so I think on that basis, it is okay. I I do see a distinction between employees asking to take holiday while they're on furlough, um, and you requiring them to take holidays while they're on furlough. Um, and the reason for that is that 
you know, there's very low risk, isn't there? If an employee is asking to take holiday, fine, no, no problem. Um, but if you are effectively enforcing that, you'd need to do it by giving notice under the working time regulations a mechanism that you're telling them to take their holidays and you need to give um, double the amount of notice than that for the holiday. So say you want to take them a week, you want them to take a week of annual leave, you need to give your notice no less than two weeks before that annual leave. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so that I think is a slightly difficult, well, it's a different consideration and there's been, those of you who have been on previous webinars know there's been some commentary around uh, the fact that it's very difficult to say you've actually enjoyed your annual leave if you have been on furlough and that's been during a lockdown period. I don't know what you think, Morag, but I think it's pro with the restrictions being eased, it's more likely that you will be able to enjoy um, annual leave um, than in the earlier stages of lockdown. Yes, yeah, um, I think that's right. But I think I think the practical problem that employees, sorry, employers are going to face now is just the amount of time if they haven't um, utilised holidays during furlough. It's the amount of time that you might have people on furlough where they're still accruing leave and taking it. Um, so we are seeing more and more employers look to do this. But as I say, it's it's going to involve a top up payment from the employer's perspective as well. So it's going to just be something that you need to, need to think through carefully. Sorry, and I keep saying to you, I'll ask you one more question and you can move on. But just because it's a question based on something you've just spoken about. But um, if a company hasn't furloughed any staff previously, am I right in saying they can't furlough someone returning from family leave? That's correct. Yeah, you, you can't um, furlough someone returning from family leave after the 10th of June. Um, if you've never furloughed anybody before, it's a good point, and I think it's it's no doubt the policy consideration behind that is to sort of say, well, if you as a business hadn't made use of the scheme at all in phase one, then you shouldn't be able to furlough anybody at all, whether they're returning from family leave or not in phase two. Um, you know, it may maybe does feel slightly unfair still um, for those returning from from family leave in that situation. Um, so yeah, good point. Thank you to whoever uh, raised that. <laughs> um, so moving on to the flexible furlough scheme. Um, so basically, this so this will come into effect from the first of July, um, and it. It's a mechanism to allow, I think, gradual return to work, basically. Let's just let's just call it that. It's only for people who've previously been furloughed, um, as we've discussed. But the employer and the employee have the ability to agree a return to work um, <coughs> on redu reduced hours. Um, and that will then effectively allow for part-time working, um, hopefully phasing up to, to a full return. One thing I would say here is that I think this is going to be more complicated just from, well, from a changes to T's and C's perspective, you need to be really careful in terms of the way that it's all documented. But also just from an administrative perspective, this is much more complicated than you are not come to work at all and you're on furlough indefinitely or for a period of three weeks to be subject to review because you can imagine let's just say you did have 50 people on total furlough um, up until the 1st of July and then you decide you're going to agree a variety of different um, reduced working patterns with all of them you're going to have to have bespoke agreements for um, all of them and then the admin side of things and we'll come on to touch on um, what's involved in that um, in a few minutes. Um, it's, I think, it's going to be much more complicated in terms of the way that you then work out what your what your claim is. Um, but in essence, just I think a couple of things to remember. Um, the government has committed, and it's quite an interesting commitment because the government has effectively created this legal obligation for employers to pay at least 80% of normal pay to anyone who is furloughed for the duration of the scheme. What changes over time is 
the subsidy that you get from the government, but the commitment from the employer to the employee will remain the same. Um, so I think that's something Im important um, to note that you, you know you, you can't taper off the pay um, that the employee receives as the scheme subsidy amounts change over the coming months. Um, so let's just take an example of someone that you agree flexible furlough with. Um, so you agree that they are going to come back 50% um, of their normal hours. And in that situation, you would agree with them what what is happening and perhaps agree with them that that's for a period of a month. In that scenario, you have to pay them their normal pay for the hours that they work. And, and I know that sounds like a really simple point, but I actually find this quite hard from a conceptual point of view. That is normal work that, you know, so they're turning up, they're delivering for those hours, you're paying them and you're you're paying them normal pay for those hours unless you've changed terms and conditions otherwise with employees in terms of their the pay that they're entitled to. And then for the 50% of their usual hours um, that they are not working, you call them furlough hours. And that some of you will have seen this terminology in the new guidance that's been updated. And so for those hours, you can claim the subsidy from HMRC um, because in effect you're, it, it's kind of like part it's part time working really isn't it it's a bit like short time um, working you're saying we'll pay you for the hours that you are working for us and for those other hours you shouldn't do any work for us stay at home um, but we'll still pay you 80% for them um, or if you're topping up you choose to top up that's fine and then you put in your claim for that. So um, there's a number of things that you need to keep a record of for this um, phase two of the scheme. Um, and you you may want to sort of create a bit of a checklist, I think, for these um, sort of situations. So you want to keep hold of and keep a record of the hours that are actually worked by the employees. The, the usual hours that an employee would have worked, but for the decrease in hours due to the coronavirus uh, pandemic, and the number of furloughed hours which the employee has been furloughed by during that period. So I know that that probably sounds like fairly obvious things, but, but I think as you come on to hear the methodology for kind of working out what the usual hours is quite complicated but that's that's where you want to get to basically is what are their normal usual hours how much time have they actually worked and so what is the leftover there are those are the furloughed hours <clears throat> excuse me do remember though that you can continue to still fully furlough people. So if you decide, you know, as Morag says, if you actually feel perhaps you're impacted by the cap on the total number of employees, you may just decide we're just going to keep doing rotational furlough for people rather than um, rather than the flexible furlough. Um, so just touching very briefly, because I, I think we could go down a rabbit hole on this, on the usual hours. Um, worked by someone it reminds me a little bit of what is norm remember we were looking at the start what is normal pay um, and you have to look at corresponding periods so for someone who's got fixed working hours the the guidance well first of all I should say there is guidance on this and it is actually very helpful because there are a number of worked examples so please do find you'll find that on the gov.uk website and um for those of you who are involved in the administration of this and perhaps your payroll teams as well, just familiarise yourself with that. But for fixed, um, fixed hours employees, then it's the last pay period before the 19th of March. So you should have um, a note there of what their usual working hours are based on that. Um, but for those who have got variable hours and pay, in irregular working patterns, you're looking at the higher of either an average of the last tax year in terms of their usual hours or the corresponding, the usual hours for the corresponding pay period in the last tax year. So 
for those people, what you would be doing is you would be working out both of them and taking whichever the higher is. So you might have someone who you're furloughing in August for the full month, but on 50% hours, you would look back at what they'd, the, the usual hours that they'd worked in August 2019, but you would also do the averaging right up to either the 5th of April 2020, or if you'd furloughed them before that, you would do your average up to the date on which you'd furloughed them in 2020. <coughs> um, so once you get those um once you get those usual hours, you're then able to deduct from that figure the number of hours that they have actually worked in August, let's just say, and that's when you're left with the, the furlough hours for which you can claim. So as I say, I don't um I don't pose to go into any more detail on that at the moment, but I I think that's where a great deal of time is going to end up being spent um, from from your and your team's perspective in terms of getting that right. So I think that all just needs to go into the mix, doesn't it, in terms of whether you actually use the flexible furlough scheme because you could be running around, um, you know, chasing your tail in terms of that those calculations, um, all for the benefit of say a week of flexible furlough. Um, so and that and that is another point. The minimum period for flexible furlough is also a week. Um, so that's flexible furlough in a nutshell. Just wanted to remind you of the tapering system. Um, so first of July, um, well for the month of July, um, nothing changes in terms of. A, the subsidy, the label subsidy that you can claim from HMRC, so it is um, exactly the same as it is at the moment. From the 1st of August, employers will be responsible for paying all employer NICs and pension contributions, so that's the that's the added cost, if you like, but you can still claim the 80% up to 2500 From the 1st of September, um, it's the a uh, first tapered reduction. So we're going down from eighty to seventy percent in terms of a uh, the government's contribution. And the cap as well as being lowered corresponding a uh, reduction in the cap from two and a half thousand to two one eight seven fifty. So that I think is well you're going to have an on cost, aren't you, in August, but you may take the view of that that's worth it then in terms of the employer next and pension contributions. I think September is going to be the point at which you're you're seeing that 10% um, added on to your costs um, for those you're furloughing. And then from October, it goes down to 60% um, with a corresponding reduction um, in the cap to 1875. Um, so, and as I say, just remember your obligation is to pay no less than 80% to those individuals. So that's where we are at the moment. Um, I think we will get some further updated guidance. Of course we will. It's <laughs> classic. We wouldn't get away with a Friday evening without updated guidance. Um, so that we've been told will be coming out later on in the week. I think there's some changes to the reservists um, scheme. I can't actually remember what that was, though, Morag. Do you remember? Yeah, it was just talking about people who I, I fall into the category of reservists to be treated similar to employees who have been on maternity leave. So if they return from a period where they've been active, but they've not been furloughed before, they can still be furloughed after the 1st of July. Um, but I do wonder if that amended guidance might also pick up the point about shielding employees as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it'd be interesting good. to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the other bit that we wanted to touch on, I'll hand over to you, Morag, on this, um, was just some uh, further legislative changes that have been brought about to address this question of abusive um, claims or fraudulent claims yeah. uh, or alternatively claims where you've made a mistake um, legitimately and what the mechanism is for that. So hand over to you, Morag. Yeah, I mean, there's been quite a lot of coverage about this in the press over the weekend as well. Um, about, well, I suppose in terms of figures, the latest figures that we have is that HMRC are investigating around 2,000 
furlough scams as they've been referred to. So it's up about eight, well, yeah, 800 since May. Um, and also Protect Tour, the whistleblowing charity, are saying that their advice line has never been as busy as it is now with individuals calling, um, making allegations of, of furlough fraud. So it's obviously a, a big issue. And I think as well, um, <sighs> I think when the scheme was introduced, it necessarily had to be introduced, and you've, you've heard us talk about this before, in a very kind of quick and broad way. Um, and so there's a bit of discussion now about, well, what about, I suppose there's there's two categories. There's people who are, who, well, there's three categories. People who have deliberately acted fraudulently, um, people who have made a mistake, and also this kind of third category of, well, they've not done anything fraudulently, but should they actually have been claiming under the scheme in the first place? Um, did they need the, the financial support or not? Um, on that first category of fraudulent claims, as we've said before, HMRC have a right to audit up to five years. And I think they will be doing that quite proactively. Um, I think as you're starting to see these headlines coming through about fraudulent claims, um, I think it is something that they will look at proactively. Uh, I suppose, hopefully for this group, that's not an issue. Maybe it's, it's something that you may be concerned about is if you've put in a claim or if there's any mistakes in the claim that you've put in and how you fix that. And I think it's a 30-day window, Jane. Is that right? Under the new rules, um, I think they're looking to amend the finance bill, which basically gives employers a 30-day window. Um, to rectify any mistakes that they've made in their, their claims. So it's almost a sort of amnesty period where as long as you let them know within that 30 days that you've made a mistake and you're not claiming as much as you originally had, um, that, that should be okay. The discussion is that that's going to be an amendment, as I said, to the Finance Bill, which I think they're looking to discuss this week in Parliament. So we'll see how that develops. Um, that third category, which is people who have claimed furlough um, or a grant through the furlough scheme, um, but may not be in a, a difficult financial position. And so this question of should they have claimed it at all or not, my view is there's no... Um, there's. Hopefully you can still hear me. I think my, my internet's gone down a little bit. Can everyone still hear me? Can someone just, yeah, thank you, Alan. <laughs> it's Jen that's disappeared, actually, not me. So, um, the uh, yeah, this question about whether it's right to claim or not, this sort of moral question is, is getting more and more coverage. I think we maybe mentioned on the last session that um, the Spectator and the Telegraph have both now decided to repay the grant that they have received on the basis that they don't feel or they don't feel they need it as much as they maybe thought they did when they first made the application. IKEA is another company this week who have come out and said that they're going to repay their, their furlough grant. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a bit of discussion about will HMRC pursue you if they think you shouldn't have claimed it? And I, 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 my view on that and our view on that is no, we don't think they will. I think the bigger issue, and it's one again that we've touched on before, is a reputational issue. And I do think what's going to happen is as organisations publish their um, finances each year and their, their financial performance each year, you might find, or this year at least, you might find that um, journalists are more likely to question then, well, if you're profitable, why did you make a, a grant for furlough? So there are increasingly organisations <coughs> who are looking to repay that grant. So it's just something to be aware of, I think. Um, Jen, I don't know, have you been able to join us again or are you lost to us? <laughs> yeah, I think I think Jane's lost us. Well, I'll pick up that question that was there before about in August, children will return to school in some form. If parents still have parental requirements such as transportation to school, etc., where do we stand legally in managing the requirements with regard to furlough leave while best managing our business? Um, on that, you'll remember there's no employees are not entitled to be placed on furlough. So there's no obligation on you to put employees on furlough, um, even if they do have those childcare responsibilities in August when, when children are back at school, um, albeit on a part-time basis. Um, you will, of course, be able to still put employees on, on furlough to help manage that, and you can do that on a, on a part-time basis. The other thing to be aware of, of course, is the risk of an indirect sex discrimination claim, just as there would be without the furlough scheme, um, if you have individuals who are coming to you to say that they have childcare responsibility and they need more flexible working, if you don't consider that request, um, then you could potentially end up with an indirect sex discrimination claim if it's a female who makes that, that request, because statistically in the UK, females at the moment have more childcare responsibility than, than males. So it's just something to be aware of on that one. 
Um, the other things I just wanted to pick up very quickly were um, there's been some coverage in the press about risk assessments. Of course, those of you that are having employees return to work will be carrying out risk assessments, particularly this point about if you have employees from the BAME community. Um, there's obviously increasing evidence now that those individuals are at higher risk of COVID-19 than others. Um, and so there's a fair bit of commentary now about ensuring that as part of your risk assessment, that's something that you're looking at in particular. Um, just to flag as well, the Liberal Democrats are um, pushing for the government to open a hotline so that employees can call in to the hotline if they think any employers um, are adopting unsafe practices at work. So again, something just to be aware of. Um, just very briefly pick up these questions that are coming through. If you have an agreement in place with unions for the old furlough scheme, should there be a further agreement in place for the flexible furlough scheme? Yes, there should. It's just the same as the old scheme in that you'll be looking to change terms and conditions. So if you have said in under the old scheme, if you've agreed with the unions that you can place a certain number of people on furlough um, and you can pay a certain level of, of uh, salary, etc., you should be looking to enter into a similar um, agreement under the flexible furlough scheme if you're looking to change the hours that staff are working. Um, and under that, the um, that oh, you're back, Jen. Thank um, goodness for that. Yeah, sorry, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> um, yeah, that actually reminds me of, remember we were talking earlier today about the, it feels like there's a weird additional hurdle that they place on the FFS scheme. So you have to agree it with the employee or the union um, in accordance with normal employment law principles and record that agreement in writing, which is the same as what effectively we've all been doing to some extent or another for the first for the first phase. But under the guidance what we've noticed is that for the phase one, they expressly say, because remember they got pressurized on this, you don't need to have a written response from the employee agreeing. You know, that sort of you write out to them to say, do you agree to all of this? And then they reply and say, Yes, I agree. They drop that requirement um, to be in writing um, after pressure for changing that in the Treasury direction after um, weeks of everyone just operating on the basis that it just needed to be a, a notification from the employer. But they don't have that in the bit of the guidance about a flexible scheme. They've dropped that bit that says you don't need anything um, in response from the employee. Now, that could just be lazy drafting. Like we've had these conversations repeatedly over the course of uh, the scheme. Uh, so it may be that we're reading too much into it, but I just, I do wonder whether um, they're thinking, well, now we've got the opportunity to impose these new um, or whatever new rules we think are appropriate for this phase two. So I, I think for those of you who want to be absolutely watertight, you may wish to do um, a more kind of comprehensive change to T's and C's arrangement there, albeit temporary, um, to get them to to sign and return um, the the letter that you send them out recording um, the proposed flexible fur furlough terms. Just because, um, you know, as Morag says, this sort of second phase seems to be much more restrictive in the approach. So um, we could be overthinking it, but then. Who knows? <laughs> that wouldn't be like us, would it, Monique? Well, I was going to say, yeah. Um, Jen, the question on commission earnings, um, whether there's been any change to how that's calculated, included for the purposes of the flexible furlough scheme? No, it's just the same, um, just the same as under the previous guidance. So if that is, if it, in effect, a, a contractual um, commission arrangement, then that can be included. It's only the kind of discretionary um, payments that are excluded. Yeah. And then a further question here, if there's been an agreement with the employee after the 19th of March to reduce their salary, and that's a permanent salary reduction, would the claim, the furlough grant, still be based on the salary at 19th March, or would it be based on the reduced salary? So wait, this is where we've this is where we've agreed a reduction to take place after the 19th of March. Yes. I think there, I, well, I guess what, what you need to do is you need to split out 
what your contractual obligation is to the employee in terms of what you've agreed and promised to pay to them and then what you can claim for under the scheme rules and you'll remember there's very specific calculation methods for what how you calculate what that person's normal wages are yes. um under the scheme rules so if you've reduced someone's pay um then after after the 19th of march you might find that the the amount that you're claiming for is actually more than um what their normal pay might be for that period but what you have to do if that is the situation is you have to make sure that that full amount of funding goes to the employee. Yes. You can't, as an employer, kind of win out um, from a, a subsequent reduction. Um, and next question, if you currently have an employee on furlough and from the 1st of July you want them to rotate one week on furlough and one week at work, is it sufficient just to notify them in writing which dates you wish them to work? Um, I would say where at all possible you want to agree this with people. Yeah. I mean, the reality is, if they're someone who is traditionally working full time, um, then there shouldn't really be a debate about you know them having a preference as such. Um, but equally, if you can, I think you want you want to try and be as accommodating as possible for people, particularly if, for example, there are really legitimate reasons for them asking for that path. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's more about uh, here. I think you you probably do need more of an interaction and a dialogue with the employees before you get to the point of notifying them of the arrangements, um, unless it's just totally totally straightforward and you don't envisage any pushback. But yeah, I I would say here you would at least probably want a, a conversation with each affected employee to say yeah. this is what we're planning and follow it up in writing. Yeah, particularly if they've been on a long period of furlough and you're, you know, you're asking them to come back. I think it's just kind of how you treat people, isn't it, in terms of making sure you're giving them time to adjust to coming back to work and letting them know that that's going to happen so they can make plans for that. Um, just a question there about, we made the point about if you've got a collective agreement with the union about under the old furlough scheme, do you need to update that under the new one? Yes, if you're looking to change anything. Somebody's asked, is it the same for an individual employee? Do you need to issue a new furlough letter? Um, the answer to that will be, it very much depends on the terms of your original furlough letter. Some furlough letters will have been very specific. Um, and said, you know, you will be on a period of furlough from this date to that date and your salary will be X. Um, and so, you you know, you would have to revisit that and change that. Other furlough letters will be a lot more flexible, which talk about we can ask you to go on furlough at any time and on terms that we notify to you, etc. And you'll have that flexibility in there that will mean that you won't necessarily have to issue a new letter at this stage. So it's really a case of looking at the letters that you issued initially and then seeing if you feel you need to make any any change to that. Um, I think though, don't you, Morag, think on that, it's a bit like that point where we're talking about having the conversation with them. I think yeah. from an engagement and an ER perspective, um, you want that touch point with them and you'll want the, the fresh agreement and in inverted commas for phase two as well. And it's maybe something to think about, um, you know, that, that document for phase two, is maybe like really important in terms of the flexibility that that gives you. So rather than going to them every month to say, and now we need your agreement to a slightly different different flexible furlough arrangement, you, you may want almost like a master agreement with them that gives yeah. you the ability to just notify them of any further changes from um, the initial period onwards rather than the kind of back and forth. And what about, this is an interesting question, if redundancy occurs later on, would it be based on the original full-time salary or the part-time one? Would this depend if the reduction was agreed as a temporary or permanent change to terms and conditions? Yeah, I mean, so SRP is calculated by reference to a week's pay, which, mm -hmm. um, as you'll all know, has that horrifically complicated um, formula for working out um, what a week's pay is for someone. So I think, you know, there might be circumstances in which you could argue that, um, you know, you're using a reduced, a reduced weekly pay figure. I think, I think that's probably a risky area. And yeah. my, my advice would be 
for SRP purposes and for notice pay purposes. Um, you use what their normal pre furlough pay would be um, because really it will boil down to well it will boil down to the calculation under the um, Employment Rights Act, but also from a contractual perspective, whether you you know whether any variation to their pay that they've agreed to from the notice pay point of view that they agreed sort of with that in mind that ultimately yeah. their notice pay might also be reduced to that extent, and I don't think many people would would expect that. Um, so I, I think as we've spoken about before on notice pay, I think the prudent approach is to pay pay a hundred percent like you would do for holidays. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to ask you one more question, Jen, because I feel like you've been in the hot seat for quite some time. <laughs> and then we can give people 10 minutes of their lunch time back. Yeah. Um, we need staff now to come back from furlough and need them to reduce their hours, either on a temporary or permanent basis. Can the employee refuse and insist on staying on furlough? Well, the employee doesn't have a right to stay on furlough because presumably your furlough letter to them will have said if we need you to come back to work um, at any particular point then we deserve the right to do that um, and you also give them reasonable notice of that. Um, the, I guess the more difficult territory there is just the changes to terms and conditions which yeah. you know there's no um, additional furlough rules on that other than it's a really difficult time isn't it for for everyone and so uh, making changes to T's and C's at this time is just a heightened level of complexity but in effect there what you would be doing is, is consulting with those individuals um, to say for whatever reason presumably in an effort to avoid more drastic measures such as redundancies or just in light of a reduction of workload we're looking to make um, either temporary or permanent reduction in hours and you'd be going through your options there in terms of hoping that you get agreement um, and consent and then if you don't get agreement and consent it's it's your choice as to whether you do unilateral imposition or dismissal and re-engagement to push through those changes. <coughs> um, what I would say is just be careful and you know your risks there are constructive dismissal um if you if you push it through unilaterally without consent um yeah. or unfair dismissal if you do dismissal and re-engagement but i think you know the fact that the furlough scheme is available doesn't give everybody who is on furlough the right to stay on it until october and i think well you know you may see that that pushback. I think the only exceptions to those categories would be, as we've spoken about before, those who are um, who have childcare difficulties or who are um, shielding or living with someone who's shielding. Uh, you know, that would be where you could see the concerns having a basis in terms of their legal protections. And I think there might be risks there in effectively forcing someone to come back. So yeah. it's a good question. And, and I think it'll be quite interesting how these conversations go over the next um, few weeks. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I'm going to let you let you off the hot seat now. Thank you very much, Jen, for all of that. I hope everyone's so found that um, helpful. Um, Jen mentioned that we've been told that there's likely to be another update this week. So we'll see what comes out of that. We'll do a, our usual update to let you know um, by email. And if it warrants another session, then of course, we'll organise that and we'll, we'll, we'll chat it through with you in a bit more detail. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention to you is we're very conscious now that employers are coming into that phase where you're starting to look at restructuring your organisation organisation, um, whether that be through changes to terms and conditions or um, unfortunately redundancies or are you looking at outsourcing part of your your, your um, workforce etc. Um, so next week we're running five one hour sessions. It's going to be very intense <laughs> um, but every day we're going to do one hour on one of those topics. So a session on collective consultation, a session on individual consultation and redundancy, a session on change in terms and conditions, a session on should be transfers and then finally on the Friday, we're going to do a session on the working environment. So things like, do you need to change your policies for home working? What kind of things do you need to be looking at from a health and safety point of view in terms of home working, but also returning to the premises? And also issues around about data security and data privacy. 
when you've got people working from home. So when we circulate a recording of the session, we'll send you details of each of those sessions. They are paid for sessions, so they're, they're, we've priced them at £75 each. Um, so if you're interested in joining those, obviously we'd be delighted to see you on them. Um, and otherwise, we'll see you on the next update. All right. Hope you all have a lovely day. And thanks, as always, for joining us today. Take care now.